hello, hello, um, and welcome to all of our viewers joining us today. Um, whether you're watching this live on Zoom or Facebook or watching this at a recorded time later, um, we here at Unpack hope that you are feeling safe and feeling well. Um, my name is Iman Ali and I'm the Policy and Programming Coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, much of my work revolves around engaging with communities, um, media, and our government to ensure a public understanding of Muslim Americans. Um, it is with this reason that we are so excited to be hosting these webinars um, and, and engaging and, and informing our, our communities. Um, much of our mission revolves around compassion and justice and if you feel that you um, resonate with, with our work, please, please, as always, feel free to email us at hello at mpac.org, and we'd love to get in touch with you and get you on board to, to join our efforts. Um, with that in mind, I am thrilled to be moderating, moderating today's webinar, Handle with Care, Treating Domestic Workers as Essential. Um, as always, for those on Zoom, please feel free to, to utilize the question and answer uh, portion at the bottom for any questions. Um, and for those on Facebook Live, go ahead and type out your questions as well. They'll come to me too, um, as we will be having a question and answer portion from our audience towards the end. So we'd love to get your feedback. Um, speaking of our guests, um, it's my honor to welcome Christina Apgar from the National Domestic Workers Alliance and Ishita Srivastava from Caring Across Generations. Um, and without any further delay, because I could go on and on about these ladies and the wonderful work that they do, um, I'm gonna pass the mic over to our president, Salamo Mariotti, to get the conversation started. Thank you, man. Thank you so much for, for leading us and uh, thank you, uh, Ishita and Christina, for joining us, uh, Caring Across Generations and Domestic Workers Alliance. These are two very important entities in dealing with the COVID-19 response and uh, uh, caretaking. So I just wanted to, to start off real quick, and if uh, both of you can tell us what your respective organizations do. Um, sure, thanks for having us. We're really excited to be on and it's great to, to see you, meet you, Salam. Um, we've heard lots of great things. Um, so I am the Director of Culture Change at uh, Caring Across Generations, which is a national campaign um, of family caregivers, seniors, people with disabilities and care workers. Um, and we kind of work to try to transform the infrastructure for caregiving in this country, both supporting the people who provide care, so family members and domestic workers, as well as um, supporting people who need care in the home. Um, and um, my work there is really focused on trying to use pop culture and storytelling to transform some of the cultural and social norms around care in this country. Christina. Hi, yeah, I'm so happy to be here. We love Unpack so much. Myself and Ashita work with one of your colleagues, Sue, all the time, and so much love to you guys. Um, so at the National Domestic Workers Alliance, we are the national voice for domestic workers, and domestic workers are house cleaners, nannies, and home care workers. Um, this workforce is 90% women, mostly women of color, and uh, many, many, many immigrants women. Um, so we represent them in all of the intersecting issues that um, uh, represent their lives. So that means gender justice, racial justice, immigration, um, uh, and labor issues. So we truly use all of the strategies that we have um, to advocate for our workforce, and that includes grassroots organizing, that includes policy work, that includes, like Ashita mentioned, culture change. I'm the culture change director, so what we do is we work a lot on telling stories and uh, using various different mediums to tell those stories. So we stay pretty busy, um, and but we keep our workforce at the center of everything we do. Yeah, and and. To that, I think you touched upon a very important piece, and that is that you know I think one of the most essential parts of gaining awareness around your movements is recognizing how many people uh, who are essential for our lives to run smoothly qualify into these categories. Can you give us, uh, can you share with us a, a story or two about some of these caregivers and domestic workers? 
Christina, do you want to go first? Okay, so um, so yes, yeah, so there are over 2.5 estimated domestic workers across the country. Um, it's really hard to get an accurate number because a lot of this work goes on behind closed doors and um, there is no HR department. It's just you and your employer directly. Um, so unfortunately right now, a lot of the stories that are top of mind right now are pretty devastating. I wish I could get on here and talk about how fabulous it is. Um, most of our workers love, love, love their jobs. They love taking care of our children and our parents and um, love being in our homes and, and keeping them clean and healthy and disinfected right now. Everybody's, you know, wants to have a clean home and um, take a lot of pride in their work. Um, we believe that these are good jobs and so we want them to have be well paid and um, get the respect they deserve. Um, but unfortunately, right now, our workers are in dire straits. Um, we had a call the other day where a worker um, had all of her jobs uh, canceled overnight. Everyone canceled their house cleaning job. Um, didn't, no one, um, yeah, overnight. So she showed us her bank account literally on the Zoom call and um, it had nothing in it. And unfortunately, um, all the relief packages that were passed, none of them will positively impact her. Um, so that is devastating. Then we have other workers who don't wanna abandon their clients. They literally are crying and saying, I don't have PPE, but if I don't go over to my client's house and care for him, who will? There is no one. Um, so our workers are as loving as ever. We say they lead with love, but they are in pretty dire straits right now. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I can share just from the family caregiver side, which is you know the other the other side of this um, sort of complex what we call this ecosystem of care. Um, there's about, again, the numbers are fuzzy, but about 44 million people in the U.S. who are caring for an adult. So that's not even counting the people caring for children. Uh, but caring for an adult means caring for a partner, caring for um, a loved one who's older, could be a parent or an aunt, or, or a loved one with a disability. And so as everybody here, I'm sure, is experiencing, um, family caregivers are often kind of we say like sandwiched between trying to do their jobs, like go to work, earn a, earn a living and care for the people they care for. Often they have, if, they're, if they can afford it, they have a domestic worker, um, home care worker coming in or a nanny coming in and helping them, helping sort of support their, their care team. So many family caregivers right now are struggling. Um, you know, we're all working from home. So the ones who still have jobs are trying to balance work and caring for their loved ones without having the kind of care squad or care team available. Some have lost jobs, many people have lost their jobs and so actually are struggling financially to care for the people they need to care for. Um, and then specifically the essential workers who are like, who have to go out and work every day, don't have any family care support or benefits. So many of their children are home without any childcare. Um, many of their parents are, are home and, on, and sort of high risk. So family caregivers are kind of, you know, at the intersection of this, this crisis. And that's why we kind of say that the front lines of this crisis actually have start at home in the ways in which different people are being affected. Um, many domestic workers also have families that they need to keep safe and care for for example. And so the ones who are going into work don't have anybody caring for their families at home. So it's quite a complex ecosystem. And the biggest sort of for us, the gap is that we don't have an infrastructure. We don't have sort of um, government supports that actually support care and support these ecosystems of care. So when a crisis like this hits, this otherwise pretty delicate um, system falls apart and people are feeling that, especially low-income families and families of color. You know, I, I, I feel the passion and the pain in your powerful testimony about these people that are really you know, invisible to the eyes of, of many of us. You, know, you don't see them on the news. You don't, you don't, 
you don't read about them very much in the newspapers. So I'm really glad that both of you are sharing this, this important perspective on, you know, this is the backbone of our society. These are people who are taking care of the things that, that we don't have time to take care of, yet they are on the front lines, as you said, Ishita, and, and they're exposed more than, than the rest of us. So we have to, we have to remember them. And, and I thank you for, for giving us these moments to, to do that remembrance. Um, I, I wanna ask also, what are our interconnected communities, domestic workers, family caregivers, and employers of domestic workers, many of whom are family caregivers, what are they dealing with in the context of COVID-19 and what do they need? I can start. Um... So our workforce is um, really having a really hard time staying safe and healthy. So in particular, our home care workers, um, it's not a surprise when I say there's no PPE. There's no PPE anywhere. Our hospitals are suffering. Well, our home care workers who are going into um, the homes of sometimes many, many clients have none. Um, we took a survey recently and only 18% had access to any sort of masks, which is pretty scary. Um, so there's also no um, access to treatment and testing. So if someone were to get sick, um, and then for our workers that would really love to stay home with their own families and stay safe, they do not have access to any paid leave or sick leave. Um, so really staying healthy and safe is, is really hard right now. Also loss of income. Like I said earlier, we have workers, I think, you know, a recent survey said around 70% overnight, no, no work, um, and no cash assistance because, um, most of the policies that were pushed through don't include them. Um, there were no in inclusions for, um, any undocumented workers. Um, or workers who are in the informal economy and pay taxes, but um, cannot apply for um, unemployment insurance. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's really, uh, it's, it's hard right now. Ashita, um, do you want Yeah, and on the, just on the family care side, what we're really, um, I mentioned, you know, people are struggling to balance their caregiving responsibilities and their work or the have lost their jobs and sort of can't um, care for their families and keep them safe. So at the, at the very minimum, what we're asking for is um, family care benefits for at least for essential workers who are going into work. Um, and when we say family care benefits, we are talking about expanding paid sick and medical and family leave um, so that they can actually like afford <laughs> to care for their families um, during this crisis. Um, and, and sort of to that, within that, we're also asking um, for some childcare providers who are actually still functioning um, to get support and to get protection during this time. So those are kind of the, in the short term, what we're asking for. In the medium to long term, um, our demand is very clearly for government like investment in a long term care infrastructure that sort of supports all pieces of this puzzle. So really making um, domestic worker jobs better jobs, um, you know, providing actually family care stipends to those families that actually need them to, to be able to care for who they need to care for, um, and making sure that actually the people who need care, especially our elders and people with disabilities, can afford the care they need. Um, and so those are kind of the longer term, you know, care infrastructure pieces that existed pre-COVID, but this crisis has really sort of driven how, home how important it is to have kind of a care infrastructure and to have sort of um, a social safety net for care. And, and what are the various resources and support that, that exist for them that we can share? And, and this would include the resources we have to share. So if there are any domestic workers on the call or that tune in later, um, you can go to domesticworkers.org and um, click on um, support if you're a worker. And we have a large resource hub that has 
tons and tons of important information for you and you can RSVP to, we have weekly webinars for workers on Thursday nights. Um, and um, you will be signed, like clued into a network that will try to support you in every way possible at this time. Um, if you are an employer to a domestic worker, go to employer.domesticworker.org. We have tons and tons of resources. And if you're a supporter, um, we would also urge you to go to domesticworkers.org. We started a coronavirus um, care fund to provide emergency relief to domestic workers. Um, we've raised $4 million, which will support 10,000 workers. Um, and we want to keep growing and growing and growing and uh, provide $400 um, to workers that have no relief right now and really, really need it. Um, and we would love your support also in pressuring Congress right now so that they can stop forgetting our care workers and our domestic workers. Um, and I'd just like to add from from the caring across generation side, I know there's a lot of people who don't necessarily identify as a caregiver who are in this moment feeling what it feeling their caregiving responsibilities, whether you know you have a child and you're just work, trying to work and take care of your child or sort of more uh, long term care responsibilities. So if you identify as a caregiver and you're on this call and are feeling kind of the stretch and the struggle or feeling a bit isolated. We have, <clears throat> we have an online community on Facebook. We do caregiver corner chats once a week to kind of share resources, um, both sort of emotional resources, but also practical resources. So um, Caring Across Generations on Facebook, um, we have a, a town hall, a family caregiver town hall coming up this Sunday, the 26th. And again, if you go to our Facebook page, you can um, RSVP there. Great and amazing work and what you're doing for people that um, are, are below the radar. They're on the front lines, but they're below the radar. We don't see them and we don't hear about them. And thank you for raising uh, their profiles and, and how essential it is, not just uh, you know for my personal care or taking care of my kids or taking care of uh, uh, others, but, but really for the, for the health of our own society. Uh, and, and we need to recognize that. So I thank you both for, for sharing these narratives with our audience. Um, finally, what can organizations like MPAC, other nonprofit advocacy groups do uh, to help in, in this time and, and to promote the work that you're doing? Um, I think, you know, one of the, one of the biggest things that this crisis has shown us is that um, caregiving, which is something that happens kind of in either the, in the privacy of our, in the sort of seclusion of our homes and in our kind of these like private units is actually not, shouldn't just be a private personal responsibility. It should be a collective social responsibility that is one a community issue, but more than that, it's actually a societal issue that should have societal governmental solutions. And I think um, that's something that you know we've always said, but this crisis has sort of brought that into the mainstream in a way that we've never seen before. Um, and so it's actually really, um, it would be amazing. It's, it's really helpful for us when um, organizations like MPAC um, that have, you know, a big community that is dealing with all of these things right now helps us sort of connect those dots. Um, because like you said, it's not really considered, it's not really in the public eye, it's not really visible, but it's something everybody goes through. So I think sort of sharing our content, sharing our calls to action and connecting the dots in any specific way that might be relevant to your community, that I think is the most um, valuable thing for us, especially right now. Yeah, and thank you for helping us identify what's meaningful in terms of our work. Uh, this, this is so important. So I'm going to hand it back to Iman uh, because uh, there are a number of questions we have from our audience. So uh, back to you, Iman. Absolutely. So just to, just to begin, you know, I, I was listening and one of the things that just keeps coming up in, in my mind is 
we at MPAC have been talking about uplifting the, the heroes of, of, of this time, right? Um, and and what, is, what is a hero? We are, we are redefining that word, I feel like, with all of the craziness that's going on. Um, and, and one of the things that I just keep thinking about is how every, every career, every job has to be treated with dignity, has to be treated as, as it is important to the, to the greater fabric of our society. And, and first and foremost, you know, I myself wanna, wanna open up and apologize to not thinking first about our domestic workers, not thinking first to our caregivers, because on a normal basis, you know, with, with more parents working now than ever, with us living longer now than ever, caregivers are so essential. Um, domestic workers are so essential. I'm gonna I'm gonna give our housekeeper a, a call tonight just to thank her for all of the work that she's always done and and I want to learn more about how to to support um, to support individuals uh, in this category but I'll I'll stop now and and we'll get to the questions from our audience because I know that they are anxiously awaiting so we have our first question. And it says, would the norm for labor laws not including caregiver and domestic workers in their protections, what are they to do to alleviate financial strain in this time? And I know, Christina, you mentioned um, the fund that you guys have with around $4 million to support 10,000 workers. But just if you guys could expand on a greater longitudinal scale, what, what can be done? So yeah, so domestic workers have been uh, excluded from labor laws. Um, way back when this has a long history and based in sexism and racism, all the reasons why this workforce was excluded um, from many labor laws. Um, right now, so I'm going to the long term right now, we have a federal um, national domestic worker bill of rights that has been introduced um, by uh, Congresswoman Jayapal and Senator Harris. Um, so we are hoping to get that passed. Um, uh, so keep an eye out for that. That would be a solution that would happen nationally. We have um, state bills of rights that we've been uh, putting through. New York has one, California has one. Um, there's nine right now. Um, so that has been trying to patchwork in the holes that are existing um, now. Um, the many, many exclusions for domestic workers. Um, and then in the short term, so we have our own care fund, um, but we are really, really, really pushing um, Congress in their next package to not forget all the essential workers that they have forgotten um, and uh, to continue to provide relief for these workers and the issues that I mentioned earlier uh, to remember our caregivers and to remember our domestic workers and to provide um, uh, PPE and to provide testing and treatment and to provide innovative solutions to cash assistance um, and to include all workers regardless of status. Um, uh, so those things in the short term, we, we desperately need to support our workers who are on the front lines, like you said. Um, and I'll just add, so I, we mentioned some of the short term pieces around, like Christina said, the fourth package of legislation. Um, but in the long term, we, um, our sort of big uh, policy solution for like a social safety net that supports care overall, it's called universal family care. And it's basically, it's a social insurance fund that everyone would pay into um, and everyone would be able to access for any care support throughout their lifetime, whether it's for childcare, whether it's for your own care, uh, whether it's for a partner or <clears throat> a parent um, or someone with disabilities. And so, you know, there's obviously right now we're trying to get sort of benefits in the short term, but we believe that unless we have an actual long term solution that supports our care infrastructure, we're not going to be able to fix the system. And Universal Family Care also asks for expanded paid medical and family leave for everybody, as well as uh, making sure that dom domestic worker jobs are good jobs in, in terms of sustaining an economy, um, a care economy. Because these jobs, as Christina said, have been, they've not only been excluded from labor laws, they're also paid really badly currently in our system. And so unless we make them better jobs and make sure more people enter this workforce and sustain in this workforce, we kind of can't have a strong care infrastructure. And so that's really our long-term um, solution. 
what, what I'm hearing is people helping people, understanding that we are in this as a collective um, and, and never knowing, you know, tomorrow I could need, tomorrow I could give kind of situation. Exactly. So, so I'm, I'm really glad that these initiatives are um, at the forefront of the work that you guys do. And Christina, I'm so happy to hear uh, the work that, that both Representative Jaipal and Senator Harris are working on. We, we work very closely with their offices and in fact have um, created a human security campaign, which I will speak a bit, uh, a bit later, but anything that we can do to bolster and uplift that legislation, we will do on our part for, for sure because absolutely if, if legislation has been passed you know once twice thrice now um, regarding you know care and, and, and a certain population hasn't been included um, boggles my mind you know but but I'm not in Congress yet so we'll see uh, I, I want to ask one thing as an Iman question and then we'll get back to the audience uh, questions is that um, in the work that you do, is there a certain demographic or a population or um, that that you often see working in in these kinds of uh, in these kinds of roles? And I ask only because the the CDC recently you know released a, a document saying that certain populations are way harder hit when it comes to the COVID pandemic than others. And I'm just thinking about you know the woman you mentioned earlier, Christina, having nothing in her bank account. You know, buying gloves costs money, buying masks costs money, buying food costs money, you know, and, and, and what are they to do when they already often don't have enough resources and are not paid properly to now absolutely being cut off? Yeah, I mean, it's true. And um, I read an article this morning about how most of the workforce that is bearing the brunt right now of being on the front lines is women and, and caretakers overwhelmingly and domestic workers overwhelmingly are women. Um, like I said, 90% of this workforce is women. Um, majority are women of color. Um, and uh, the intersection of women of color and also the immigrant community. And then we have like a large base of our workers who are undocumented. Um, and right now, all of those intersections of identities are particularly vulnerable and literally being left out of any sort of relief or solutions. And a lot of our workers were already, um, as Ashita mentioned, the wages are, are quite low. Um, uh, we're already living on the edge. And I think more and more this crisis has showed us how much of our society is right on the edge. And if, you know, one emergency comes, the, the whole structure falls apart. So our workforce overwhelmingly um, is living right on the edge of not being able to um, meet their immediate needs. Half of our workforce wasn't able to pay rent in April. 80% are fe feeling food scarcity not able to buy groceries right now. Um, so when we say living on the edge, it's a lot, it, it, it's, it's quite significant. We're talking about some of the most essential things, our health, our safety, being able to eat, having a roof over your head. Um, so our workforce is very, very, very vulnerable and has felt particularly under attack. Um, overwhelmingly the last couple of years. So, um, you yeah, know, it's hard. And on the side of, you know, one thing I, I want to make sure I mention is that the people we're, we're talking about caring for in terms of long-term care are older adults and people with disabilities. And those communities, obviously in this crisis, are the, at the highest risk um, and also the most isolated. Um, and for them to actually stay healthy, the best for many people, not for everybody, but for many people, the best kind of care they can get is in their home. Um, and so to actually protect that and to enable them to be cared for in their homes is, is really important. Um, there's been a lot of narratives in the media around who is, who is disposable in this crisis and you know, older adults and people with disabilities are constantly left out of our narratives. And especially in this moment, there's been Kind of some you know horrific talk about how you know who who can who who can be sacrificed for the economy and it's you know beyond reprehensible and um, awful narratively but that also translates into um, policy and supports and so just to kind of mention those communities as well. 
think we have to demand better. And then the work that you guys are doing most certainly, uh, you know, brings to light that this is not, you know, some, some far-fetched idea of, of everyone being treated with, with dignity and respect. This is what any of us would expect if the roles were reversed. Um, and again, I, I know I keep commending you on your work, but I'm just, I'm sincerely just so blown away at how for so long um, this has been out of such a, a public lens of, of concern. And I'm very, very glad and enthusiastic that it's, it's coming to the forefront because most certainly um, it, it needs to be. So our next question from the audience is going to be um, oh, wonderful. So it says, what can those who have employed domestic workers do during this time to help support and uplift domestic workers? And I really like this question actually because I think in many homes, we have, you know, our news channels on constantly and we're like, all right, Congress is going to pass this law and it's going to fix this. But I'm, I'm just saying on my end, I'm kind of tired of waiting on them. I want to know what as a community, what as a collective, you know, there are more people not in Congress than there are in Congress. So I want to know what can we do as a United States, as a united group of people to, to help your cause and, and great question to, to whoever asked it. Wonderful, wonderful thought. Um, it is. And I want to kind of echo back to what you were saying earlier, like you're going to call your house cleaner. So like the first thing you can do is um, check in. You know, you'd be amazed how far just a little emotional connection can go and be like, I see you not just as a worker, but as a human. And, you know, how are you? How are you doing? Um, and then second thing, um, if you are still requiring your worker to come in, if you need them still, uh, plan for mutual safety, like actually talk about it. Be like, you know, how are you doing with social distancing? I have gloves, do you have gloves? You know, really talk about those things. Um, the third thing is offer financial support. So um, we largely have said the guidance is if you can continue to pay, please continue to pay if you can uh, for as long as you can. If you can continue to pay um, for um, the services that are not being provided at a percentage, continue to do that as long as you can. Um, try to uh, get creative. So pay for future services. Be like, you, you know, can I pay for the next three visits ahead of time? Because I think, you know, it might, would it be helpful to you to have an advance right now? Um, so there's a bunch of different ways that you can be creative, but you can, um, you know, provide support to your worker right now who might be really suffering. Um, and then the third piece, the fourth piece is to stay informed. So um, having a movement and, and, you know, you guys know as well, because you build power for your community. Um, now that you know, stay informed and keep, you know, telling your friends, if you have friends that are employers, share the information with them, have conversations. A lot of time employers don't consider themselves employers um, and they don't talk about it with other employers. So be like, hey, I just, I know we both employ the same house cleaner. Have you checked in on her? I checked in on her. This is what I'm doing. Those kind of informal conversations between friends, between em employers are really, really important. So, um, I wouldn't uh, discount those things that feel small, but they're actually quite big. And and you know, um, in 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 Islam, there's a saying that says, if your neighbor is suffering, and you are at ease, then then you are not doing right. You know, if if your neighbor goes to hungry and you go to sleep with a full belly, then then justice is not happening. So Christina, our community is now your community. Your community is now our community. We, again, will do all that we can to uplift because in, at the end of the day, um, we are we are all human and we all you know need the house over our head the food in our bellies and and the respect and dignity that it takes to that it takes to go on so i want to thank both of you um christina and ishida for joining us um, and sharing about how we can all contribute to working towards granting protections um, for domestic workers and caregivers um, and with that in mind i want to go back to what i mentioned earlier about our human security campaign um, we have been working very very diligently um, 
to promoting our human security campaign. Um, and our campaign is really focused on alleviating the suffering of the most vulnerable communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have formulated our campaign to having three very key areas um, of reform, healthcare, labor, and criminal justice. Um, and we are working very closely with government officials and agencies to ensure that rights resources and securities are maintained during this turbulent time. Um, to learn more about our campaign, I encourage you to go to our, our website, mpac.org, and in the search bar, just type in human security. We tried to make it as easy as possible. Um, I could go on about it for hours, but um, I, I, I definitely encourage everyone who can to, to look it up because the traction is growing. We've, we've been um, supported by an array of communities um, and organizations and we're very excited to get the ball rolling um, and we most certainly will be looking at all of the legislation that comes into play with domestic workers and caregivers as well because this again you mentioned is a very vulnerable population so anything we can do to uplift um, will, will most certainly be happening. Um, to our viewers, I hope that you enjoyed our webinar, as always, um, and I hope that you please, please join us this Thursday at noon uh, Pacific time, three o'clock Eastern time for our webinar discussing the necessity for community services with leaders from Access Michigan and Access California. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our webinars, you may visit mpac.org forward slash webinars. Again, we're keeping it easy, very simple to remember. Um, I hope that you have a very safe week and you join us again soon. And thank you so much to both of our guests. Um, we, we hope to have you again soon. Thank, thank you. you so much for having well, us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.